Great. OK, so as I said, my name is Avesh. I'm a software engineer here at Cardiogram. Um, like, uh, like Pete, I was at Google before this. And um, joined Cardiogram about six, eight months ago, about a year and a half. Uh, our company is about a year and a half years old. Uh, so I'll, I'll tell you about us. Um, so imagine that you're, you're out for a run. You look down at your smartwatch, and you see your heart rate spiraling past 200 BPM. When you call an ambulance, the paramedics tell you you have supraventricular tachycardia at a normal heart rhythm. Uh, that's what happened to Matt, one of Cardiogram's users. Now, the question is, Matt, like 60 million other Americans, was wearing a wearable device. And this year, the Apple Watch alone will generate 2 trillion heart rate measurements. So what Cardiogram is trying to do is sift through all this data to identify early signs of cardiovascular disease. So in a sense, if, if anyone here has seen Big Hero 6, what we're trying to do is transform your smartwatch into a personal healthcare companion. So we're live right now on the iOS App Store. We have, a, as of this week, we have 200,000 monthly active users. And behind the screen is our chart, which, which shows our DAUs and MAUs. That ratio is pretty good. We're at a 73%, which is like higher than Facebook even. This is the DAU to MAU ratio. Um, and the, the really exciting news this week is that we launched our alpha on Android. So we now support cross-platform, Android and iOS. So before I go any further, I want to introduce the team, who I think are all here. Um, so Brandon and Johnson are over there in the corner. They are our co-founders. Both are ex-Google machine learning engineers. Um, you should chat with all of us afterwards. Um, Kai is our design and front-end engineer. Uh, before this, he worked at TinyRx, working on delivering uh, pharmaceuticals. Um, Brian and Kevin are, OK, I thought you guys were still working. <laughs> Brian and Kevin are back there. Um, they both were TAs for machine learning at uh, Berkeley and Stanford, respectively. And uh, Daniel is our summer co-op um, from Waterloo. Uh, my name is Avesh. Uh, I went to Carnegie Mellon and was at Google before this. So the theme, the initial theme that I have for this talk is, um, is deep learning in medicine. Um, and the thing to understand with deep learning in medicine is that each label is a human life at risk. So these are two reviews we got in the App Store. They're two labels for us. So in the first one, this is actually the user I told you about at the beginning of this talk. This person had a supraventricular tachycardia. The second user is a combat veteran who's experiencing PTSD. So the reason I bring this up is because it shows how hard it is to collect labeled data. That's why I thought that a good general topic for this talk would actually be not deep learning in medicine, but deep learning with limited labeled data. Because maybe that'll be useful to some of you. So there's four sections to this. I'm going to start off by describing the data that Cardiogram has, our inputs and our outputs, the scale of it, put it in a historical context. Um, after that, we're going to talk about three techniques that we use to do uh, training, even with this limited amount of data. Uh, the first one is a totally unsupervised technique, which some of you may have heard of. It's a sequence autoencoder. Um, the second one is a weekly supervised technique where we're generating labels. We call this heuristic pre-training. And the final one is a novel technique, which we actually haven't implemented yet. Um, but last week, uh, Kevin gave a tech talk on this, so we're, we're thinking about it. Um, and this is on Siamese neural networks. So let's, let's dive into it. Let's start with the data. So we're getting all of our data from smartwatches. Right now, all of our training data is from the Apple Watch. And this comes in as a time series. So at a particular time, we have a heart rate measurement for this user. And maybe five seconds later, we get a new heart rate measurement. And we also have step count data, so 24 steps in, for this user. Um, and we, this is all a time series data. The important thing to note here is that it's a multi-time scale data set. So it's not that we consistently get step count measurements every five minutes. We get them whenever Apple chooses to give them to us. And for heart rate measurements, we get them either every five minutes or every five seconds, depending on whether the user is working out right now. So for that reason, our input data includes three different channels. So it's the heart rate, the step count, and your delta in time, the time since the previous measurement. And we encode all this into a NumPy array and use that to train using TensorFlow. Um, so in terms of the scale of data we have, um, we have, have 12,000 people who we have labels for. Um, the important thing here is labels, because as you heard, we have 200,000 monthly active users. But most of these people, we don't know what diseases they have. Um, so from these 12,000 people who we have labels for, we can generate 480,000 person weeks of data. And that's the unit that we trade on, a person week. So that's our input data. Let's talk about the output, the labels here. So as our name suggests, the main condition that we're after is atrial fibrillation. 
it's a heart arrhythmia, so when your heart beats abnormally. And it's a condition that you go in and out of. So you can see for this user, initially, she did not have atrial fibrillation, and later on she did, and later in the day she did not. Um, so the other conditions that we're predicting are actually not time series. These are, these are four other conditions that are related to heart rate, diabetes, sleep apnea, high blood pressure, and high cholesterol. And because these aren't time series and we want to train multitask, we just align these time steps with all the time steps we have an atrial fibrillation reading. Does that make sense? So all of the rows here for diabetes, sleep apnea, high blood pressure, these are all the same. We just copy the values over. Cool, so to give you a sense of the scale of our data, the number of positives we have for most of our conditions is between 1 and 2,000. Um, and remember, we're training on user weeks of data, which is a nice way for us to get like an order of magnitude more data. So we have, for each condition, between 10 and 30,000 positive user weeks. Um, and we have about 80,000 total user weeks. So those are, these are including the negatives. Um, the exception here, or the, the like outlier here, is atrial fibrillation, where we don't really care about user weeks. We care about how many occurrences of atrial fibrillation you have. So to put this in some context with the amount of data we have, uh, so this is like a timeline of deep learning. And it's missing a lot. Um, but back in 2012, there was AlexNet. It was presented in NIPS. It won, um, what's it called, the ImageNet competition. Um, and it was image recognition, convolutional neural network. It was trained at 1.3 million images. Um, now, moving forward into the world of medicine, there have been two major advances in deep learning for medicine. Uh, the first was, um, was, or was Google's diabetic retinopathy paper. They presented in JAMA in 2016. Um, so this was trained on 130,000 images. And later that year, or early next year, was Stanford's skin cancer detection. Some of you guys might have seen this paper. So they took a, a photo with your mobile phone of a, of a mole and determined whether it was cancerous or not. So that was trained on 130,000 images as well. So for us, our data scale is a little smaller than theirs, but still on the same order of magnitude. We have 80,000 labels. And that, what that means is that each label is precious for us. So we're doing deep learning. We call our deep learning architecture deep heart. And in the past, when I've given non-technical presentations, this is the slide that I show. And I think it's great because you have this like ominous tensor flow code. It's kind of hard to see, but this green code in the background. And then you have all these, this like spider web of whatever this is, this flow chart maybe. Um, so because this is a tech talk, we're going to actually break this down a little bit more. So this is what our actual architecture is. Um, and I guess, so I can know how much, how much context to give. Raise your hand if you know what a convolutional neural network is. OK, that's like 60%. That's like and raise your hand if you know what a recurrent neural network or what an LSTM is. OK, cool. And I won't, I won't bore you guys too much. But um, the, the idea behind convolutions, this is a technique that started off in image recognition. Um, it's that you take a chunk of your input data. So for an image, this could be like a 5 by 5 block of pixels. For us, it's a segment of heart rate data. And you apply some operation to it. And then you apply that same operation to every chunk of your input data. Um, so it's a way of reducing the number of trainable parameters. Because the alternative would be to have a different multiplier for each input. But that would, be, that would take a long time to train. That would also require a lot more training data because it's a larger model. Um, and the LSTMs, this is a type of recurrent neural network or recurrent neuron. So it's a, it's a time series. Um, so the idea here is that our, our input data is time series. It's the heart rate and step count. Um, so at each time step, you feed the data into an LSTM. It may save some internal state and pass on its state to the next time step when it receives the new input data. And, and it's, a, it's a way of, of memorizing, or not memorizing, of keeping long-term state over time in a, in a neural network. Um, so with that context out of the way, what we basically have is this is the input data I explained before. After that, we have three residual convolutional layers, then four LSTM layers. And finally, have one really simple convolution whose purpose is just to map down the output from the 64 units down to our five outputs, which are the five conditions we're predicting. Um, so this, this is a pretty standard setup. Um, it, initially, it was taken from a speech recognition paper. that We made some modifications to it. Um, and the first thing I promised to talk about was the unsupervised sequence autoencoder, a method of, of training without labeled data. So here's the idea. We take, the, um, we take these layers, the convolutional layers and the LSTM layers, and we, what's it called? We view these as an encoding of the input into some hidden space. So this is our encoder. And we, we also create a decoder, which is just the mirror image of this. So we add more LSTM layers and more convolutional layers. Um, and then we ask this new architecture to predict its input. 
right? So you can say that it's trying to memorize the input. And what we actually do to prevent that memorization is we add Gaussian noise to the input. So we see this as a denoising autoencoder. Um, show of hands, who's heard of this technique before? OK, roughly like a third of the folks here. It's, it's pretty common. And it's actually the technique that we found works best for us. So I guess I um, should warn you, there's code ahead. Um, so uh, for context, so raise your hand if you are a coder, if you, if you code in your day-to-day -day job. OK, that's good. I have the right crowd. Uh, raise your hand if you've coded in TensorFlow. OK, good number. Brandon's got his hand up. <laughs> um, and, uh, and how about Keras? OK, most people in TensorFlow are coding in Keras also. That makes sense. It's, it's officially supported by Google now. Um, so the code samples here are all Keras, because that's what we use as a layer on top of TensorFlow. We could use a different backend like Theano, um, but we, we started off the code base of TensorFlow, and now we have some TensorFlow-specific code. So let me, let me walk through what this is doing. It's is my mouse here? No, I just pointed it. It's pretty straightforward. Um, so we have, we have this encoder that we define. Um, and this is what we're going to use for the actual supervised training. So we stack on the convolutional layers, which are just conv1ds. And we stack on the recurrent layers, which is this LSTM. Um, and then we save that into the autoencoder variable. And then we reverse. We add more recurrent layers. We add more convolutional layers. Um, and finally, there's this one last dense layer that we use to change the output dimensionality. So once we define this autoencoder, it's easy to train. As promised, we just take our x, our heart rate and step count data. We add some Gaussian noise, just a random normal variable multiplied by 0.5. Um, and that becomes our input data, this noisy train x. And the output is train x. Um, we, run, we run for about 40 epochs. Uh, this is actually very slow, because we train on a large amount of data. Because we, we could use all 200,000 of our monthly active users for this, because we don't need labels. We don't, because that takes too long. But because of the scale of data we train on, this takes about like four or five days right now um, to, to train this autoencoder. But luckily, once we've trained it, we just save the weights in this H5 file, and then we restore them prior to doing supervised training. Make sense? Cool. All right, so the next technique I wanted to talk about is this weekly supervised heuristic pre-training. So basically what this is, is uh, synthesizing our labels. Oh, the phone is because someone's late and they're coming up. Um, so this is, this is where we synthesize labels. Um, so there's, there's a lot of medical literature on detecting AFib. And in particular, there's a paper that came out in um, 2013 in the, um, the Heart Rhythm Society, the Heart Rhythm Journal, um, which is by this guy named McManus. And the idea here was that you can take heart rate measurements and take their Shannon entropy or take their root mean squares differences and use that as an indicator of whether or not the individual is experiencing atrial fibrillation. I mean, this is intuitive, right? If your heart rate's bouncing all over the place, you're most likely having an arrhythmia. Um, so we use this as inspiration to come up with a very, very simple function which is just this successive BPM differences. So we take the BPMs for a particular user, and we take the differences of successive ones, take that absolute value, and then we average that over a window of time. And this metric, we consider a label then. So we train our deep neural network, the architecture I showed you before, to predict these labels. Um, and I guess the, oh yeah, and I guess let me, let me dive into code then. Um, so we call this the McManus baseline. Um, and we actually train multitask. So we train on different window sizes of this average BPM difference. That's what's happening over here, with 30 seconds, 5 minutes, and 30 minutes. Um, and within this function, it's doing exactly as I described. Um, it goes through. Chunks are user weeks. So it goes through all the user weeks. It iterates through the timestamps that we have and finds all of the heart rate measurements within a particular window, like 5 minutes. Um, and then it just takes their absolute value of the difference, the so successive heart rate measurements, and it averages that. And that's your predicted y. That's what you train on. So once we have this, we generate this, uh, this y um, numpy array. Um, and we, and then we, we will pre-train the DNN. Uh, the one thing I'll point out here that's kind of convenient is that this class is structured the same way as any other model that we build. So any other model that we train and or run train and predict on. Um, and notice there's no train operation here, because there's no training that happens. This is purely a statistical method. But we found it very convenient to make all of our baseline predictors and our data and architectures follow the same base model class. So we can use the same sort of accuracy like metrics tooling that we have. Um, 
So once we have uh, once we have this this fake Y, this like fake labels, we we just train on this. It's, it's pretty straightforward. So we add a simple convolution, um, and the purpose of this, as before, is to change the dimensionality into in this case three because there are three different window sizes. Um, and then we train the model. So we take our x data, and we train to fit the heuristic y. Uh, we save those weights in some location, and then we use those weights to, um, as initialization parameters for the supervised training. Uh, yes? Uh, I'm just curious, could you clarify your label? Was it the difference between the deep and the baseline average? But uh, over what time period? And then like the, how early are you talking about? Yeah, 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 I see what you mean. This actually is not versus the average. It's versus the previous BPM. So if you have a stream of like 50, 60, 70, then it, your differences are going to be 10 and 10. I guess that was a kind of funny example because the average works out the same way. But if it was 50, 60, 75, it would be 10, 15. Oh, wait, you said a relevant time window over which what? Uh, oh, yeah. So, so for this, our, we're only doing this on one week of data. Um, so we have these windows. So if we have 30-minute windows over one week of data, then we'd have like one week's worth of, worth of hours divided by 30 minutes. That's how many labels we would have. Yeah, the only reason why we have only one week of data as input is an infrastructure reason. Um, our LSTMs are already pretty slow to train. Uh, typically, your input data would be like a sentence if you're doing text-to-speech or translation. Um, but for us, we have 4,096 time steps, and that makes training pretty slow. Because we would love to train on a longer period of time, especially for predicting conditions like diabetes. Uh, but that's, that's an ongoing challenge right now. Cool. So from these two techniques, I mentioned that we tried these. These are our, these are our results that we published uh, we, that we've submitted as a, as a publication. Um, so basically what we found is that the unsupervised pre-training, the first technique I talked about, works significantly better than no pre-training for, um, oh, I guess I have, for high cholesterol, sleep apnea, high blood pressure, and actually for atrial fibrillation as well. That's not listed on this chart. Um, and the only case where the LSTM with no pre-training works better is diabetes. But it's within, it's within a, um, a standard deviation of the heuristic pre-training. So the, the final technique I wanted to talk about was something we haven't tried yet, but is a pretty interesting uh, technique that we call, or we don't call this. This is, this is something that was written in a paper in 2015. Uh, so Siamese neural networks. Uh, who here has heard of this? OK, only three of you. That's good. <laughs> um, so here's the idea. Uh, this, is a, this is an unsupervised technique. So we take two pieces of input data. In our case, it's two user weeks of data. And we try to predict whether or not they're from the same user. Um, so the architecture here is that we use the same DNN architecture for supervised training, but we actually have two DNNs with the weights tied. Um, and that means the weights are always the same. During backpropagation, you just take the average of the gradient updates. Um, and, and what we do with the output of these DNNs is we actually cut off at a, at a hidden layer and look at the hidden state. And we take some difference metric between the two hidden states. Um, so that's, let's see. So that's what's happening here. We take the Euclidean distance between the hidden states of each of these two DNNs for some input. And the idea here is that it should be very similar if these two inputs come from the same user and very different if they come from different users. And that's, that's where we get our loss function from. So, if, um, so y here is going to be 1 if this is from, which one is it? if it's from the same user. Because in that case, it's 1 times y hat squared. We're trying to minimize this term. So that should be, as, as that should be very small. This number should be very small. These two vectors should be pretty much the same. And in the other case, when this, this data comes from two different users, we, we basically try to maximize y hat within some margin. Um, so y hat just needs to be higher than this margin. And then this term will turn out to be pretty large. Um, did that make sense? <laughs> uh, questions? Yeah. Uh, where does the data for all the weights come from? Is that you guys do yourself or is it? 
Oh yeah, so the, the weights start off as, as randomly initialized. Um, and then after that, they're, they're adapted through training. Yeah. Where do you guys get your original GitHub labels? Oh yeah, that's a good question. So um, we, we collaborate with UC San Francisco. Um, and we've started a study there called the M-Rhythm study, where we have a bunch of our users, about 20,000 of them, enroll in this study, and they fill out medical surveys. And if they say that they have AFib, then we confirm them by sending them these, uh, these like handheld devices, which are basically, if you know what an ECG is, they're basically ECGs. And that's how we get these time line labels of when someone is or is not experiencing AFib. Cool, so I'll walk through a bit of code here, um, which maybe will clear this up. If not, ask me more questions. Um, so what's happening here is we're taking the, the Euclidean distance between the output of the same DNN on two different inputs. Um, Euclidean distance is defined up there, Euclidean distance tensor flow, and it's just as you remember it, the square root of the sum of squares so of the, the differences. Um, that's wrapped around a lambda just so you can run it through tensor flow. Um, and then once we have this, we, uh, sorry, <coughs> We, uh, we train the model, um, so we try to predict this y, which we generate up here. So we have, we have our input data x, and we have this create pairs function, which is not listed, but it's basically generating pairs of data, either that are from the same user, in which case the y will be equal to one, or from different users, the y will be equal to zero. Um, and then we train the model to predict y, given this x data that's from either the same or different users. Um, OK, so questions now. Yes? Yeah, yeah. So the idea is to have something more personalized. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Um, the only the reason why we haven't done that yet is mainly because we're limited in dev time and dev capacity. Um, but there's also a lot less data then, right? Because you have you have one person's data maybe for the two years they've owned an Apple Watch. So it's it's a bit it's a bit harder of a problem. Yeah, yeah, no, that's true. I think that is a pretty good idea. Um, and especially if we can process longer streams of data than just one week, that would be really valuable. Imagine each specific person has so many different like, factors that are affecting the heart rate that like, just looking at the one person over a longer time like, might give you a better result in their specific change. Yeah, so one thing that's kind of related to this, which we're actually Brian experimenting with, is um, normalizing the data per user, right? So that if someone has a much lower resting heart rate, that they, they can be treated the same because their data is just normalized. That's a very simple approach to this problem. Cool. Um, yes? Oh, yeah. And you may be finding that there's a correlation between, I mean, you can throw in like a genetics, or you can throw in some other kind of behavioral sort of aspects with your F-score. I'm trying to figure out where you're applying your F-score. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me get some more context. So I've explained what the Siamese neural network is, but I haven't explained what we could do with it. So there's, there's two main things that we could do. Um, so one of them is based around user authentication. Um, so people care a lot, people here, meaning health insurance companies, care a lot about whether you're wearing the same, sorry, whether you're wearing the device that, um, that you say you are. So let's say, let's say your health insurance company, company gives you like $3 if you walk 3,000 steps in a day, which Humana does right now. They want to know if you just give your watch to your friend who's like a marathon runner. So that's, that's one case. The other case, which kind of alludes to the name of few shot learning, is once we've trained um, a DNN in this way, we could, as one of the X's, put in a user who has diabetes, 
and as the other X, put in a user who we don't know if they have diabetes. And in that sense, this is a one-shot learning technique, which is going to be very, very noisy. But that's another possibility. Um, we haven't tried either of these yet. We actually haven't implemented this yet. This is just an idea that we were talking about. Yeah. Oh, was your question? Uh, yeah, I'm wondering uh, if the conditions that you're looking for, are they necessarily like binary? Or I mean, are they kind of sliding scales? And really what constitutes at that point if it's severe or mild or all that? Yeah. That no, that's a great question, because we treat them as binary. But in reality, they're not. So in particular, diabetes, uh, that definition, or that's defined as where, what your A1C score is. And there's a scale here. There's pre-diabetes and diabetes. Um, so predicting A1C scores directly is probably very difficult. I think that a task that may be more useful and attainable for us would be predicting pre-diabetes separately from diabetes. Um, right? Because like, I think it's one in four Americans have pre-diabetes. It's like this hugely prevalent condition that many people don't know they have. Uh, so if we can detect that and notify people, you can, you can reverse prediabetes through like a, a wellness plan. Cool. So we're actually, we're moving on to kind of general questions, which is good because this slide is on questions. So okay, continue. Uh, yes? How real time does the response from you need to be? Like, could it be something asynchronous, like you have diabetes, three days after you detect it? Or is this something that's like a heart attack or something? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, for all of our conditions, it's something that we can tell users a few days later. Um, and that's really important, because in order to do our predictions, we need to do a data poll. Um, and that, that is currently just a batch job that we run. If you ran something on, like, at the edge, even like a smaller model would be useful to notify them to... Uh, in the case of these five conditions, for the most part, it's not. Um, because if you, say if you find out that you have atrial fibrillation, <laughs> Um, you'll go to your cardiologist, they may give you like a, a treatment plan, they may put you on a medicine, but it's not that within the next 24 hours you need to like get to the emergency room. That would be like, there's a condition called atrial flutter, which is a different kind of heart arrhythmia, that we're explicitly not going after because you need a very fast response time for that. Oh, uh, yes? Can you talk about how you deploy your systems and how you keep them fresh? Like, is there virtual controlling? Like, what's going on there? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So I think there's a... There's a few things. So the, the ML to predict conditions, we've only deployed so far in observational studies. Um, so right now, it's we have this group of patients that we know have, say, diabetes, and we keep some in our holdout set. And then we predict on those patients and publish papers based on those results. Um, we do have a machine learning server, which we're, which we're currently working on, uh, which is a challenging thing to, to um, sorry, it's a challenging engineering feat, uh, evaluating these models for all of our users in real time. Um, in terms of version control, the, there's a couple of important best practices, I think, for version control when you're doing machine learning. The biggest one that we found is to version your data. Um, we, we, have, we used to have a lot of problems with, like, oh, you'd make this small modification to a data set because, like, oh, obviously you should be normalizing the heart rates. But then your old models don't perform as well as they used to. Um, and that's a real nightmare when there's no way to tell when the data was modified what version it is. So like, the process we strictly adhere to now is that every data set has like v0.1, v0.2. And whenever you make any change, you update that version number. Um, and it's important on the same level of hygiene with your models as well. Where, like, when, you have a, when you have a production model, uh, check it in somewhere. And that H5 file is then your gold standard that you can compare against. Because future experiments should be, can I beat this H5 model in an experiment? And you'll have your experiment of your DNN and your base model, and your and sorry, and your baseline will be just this this file which gets loaded into memory into the DNN. So that's that's a great question. And hopefully those best practices are useful. They were, yeah, 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 they were hard earned. <laughs> Is there a reason why you don't run your classification on your devices? Oh, yeah, that's that's a good question. Could you repeat that first? Oh yeah, the question was: Is there a reason why we don't run our classification on devices? Um, and the main reason is because we don't need to right now. Uh, because we can do our classification in batches. Um, but right, like the new iPhone has a trip that's specifically meant for a machine learning model evaluation. So that's something that we could consider running on device. Cool. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about how your users are uh, receiving uh, your experience and how they are receiving your, the information? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we typically have a countdown of like how many hours until they have a heart attack. And, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, so we're just starting, we're just beginning to experiment with this. The, um, the big project right now is something that we're calling Care Pathways, which is how we get a user 
Well, we begin with flagging a user. How are we actually get them diagnosed, get them to a doctor, and then get them on a path to well-being or to wellness? Um, and right now, in classic startup fashion, we're doing things that don't scale. We're emailing our users. Um, eventually, we'll build out a UI within the app. No, what do the users think about uh, how are they accepting it? Are they taking this uh, conclusion to the doctors? Or, uh... I think in the cases where we've emailed them, they have been taking the, this conclusion. We've been doing this only for AFib, so we have been, they have been reaching out to their cardiologist. Because, yeah, that is, that is a big challenge, right? Like taking medical advice from an app. Yeah. Uh, you think that it will just uh, get incorporated into our uh, thinking over time? Or? I think that's happening already, right? Like you have these diabetes prevention programs like, um, like Livongo and um, Omada Health, which are, which are apps that are meant to reverse your prediabetes, or in the case of Livongo, even your diabetes. And users are, are trusting these apps, and they're working. Um, so I think that this is a shift that we're seeing. No, no, go ahead. Uh, play with the system. I mean, do they, so the users can convince themselves, do some experiments on them uh, themselves. Uh, that's how we do it ourselves, right? Uh, uh -huh. uh, probably, I know, more time. Oh, do you mean like give users more insights into where we're getting our predictions from? Yeah, plus if the user themselves can uh, sort of tune the types of data to test whether are valid or not. Oh, yeah. With themselves, uh, quickly. Uh, that would become more convincing them. Yeah, but that's, that's a great point. Like, something that we think about is when we flag a user with a condition, what report do we send their doctor to convince them that they actually have this condition? Um, and this is actually like a, a technical problem that like, machine learning has solutions for. Right? We could use attention for this sure. and look at which parts of the input stream attention is focused on. Um, and yeah, that's not something that, we, that we've done yet, but that's, that's an interesting area of research. Cool. Yeah. Just one more question. How do you okay. Oh, yeah, that's a great question. So because we're doing early flagging, like the process that we go through is we'll flag a user with, say, atrial fibrillation, and then we'll send them this device, the Alive Core, that's FDA approved. Um, and because of that, uh, we, don't, we don't experience these liability issues just because we're doing early flagging. Right, it's a little different than like testing out a drug, in which case you could really injure users by, by giving them a drug that doesn't work. Cool. Yeah. All right, well, thank you so much. Thank you.